Happy Mother's Day to all the moms. Thank you to all the moms and mother figures and just all the roles that moms hold. Man, we see you and we are so grateful that you chose to spend your morning here with us. Uh, we just acknowledge that we are a place that wants to make a seat for, um, for everybody who is here, that we want to make room at the table, and we want you to bring your authentic self, who it is that you are, who you've been made to be, your voice and your story. And so particularly on Mother's Day, I know that based on our stories, it can just hold um, a lot of different emotions or feelings. There can be uh, really joyful things, really difficult things, things that... Um, experiences of grief or loss, and, and Mother's Day can just be one of those tricky times where everybody is probably coming in with something, and it might be a little bit different. And so one thing I love about the church and I love about the way of Jesus is the ability to hold space and tension for what's good and also hard, what's joyful and also messy. And so just know this morning that whatever it is that your experience um, in your own motherhood, your experience with your own mother or the lack of an experience with your mother, um, any grief or loss you may be processing today, the uh, desire to be a mother, but yet that's not what you're experiencing or receiving, just so many, rain, those who, of you who are caring for their mothers as they age or in different seasons of life, may we just hold space this morning for the complexities of Mother's Day, for each of our experiences and stories, and just know that there is room today and that you are seen. And so part of Happy Mother's Day is just saying, like, we see you, you have space here, and we're glad you're here. So turn to whoever is around you and say, I see you. Say, I see you this morning. I see you. That's right. Well, uh, we have been um, in this book of Romans, and so I'm excited today because there's actually this sort of parallel between Mother's Day and women and the book of Romans that we are in, so we get to discover that together. But this idea of Mother's Day and, and all the stories that we bring with our experiences of our mother or motherhood, it reminds me of all the things that women hold, there is this artist who um, has a profile on Instagram and a couple reels that have gone around, but she did a whole series of artwork on like women holding things, she called it. And it was just pictures and it was everyday things like groceries or babies or bicycles or bags of stuff or moving furniture or, you know, holding supplies. It was just this idea, a picture of women doing everyday things holding everyday things, but this parallel to all it is that women hold. The various roles, the various ways we show up, the various responsibilities, the various seasons of life, the, the different people that we're caring for, or the ability to kind of go in between all these different roles and names and stories. Mother's Day, I think, reminds us of just the capacity of women and what it is that we hold what it is that we carry. And I think when we talk about how women hold or what they hold or the way that they hold, a lot of that can be defined by all these external voices, right? Society, culture, family culture, Christian culture, a lot of people have a lot of things to say about what we hold, how we hold it, how we show up, what that looks like. Even in my experience, just being in the baby, the baby season, so we're about to be out of that baby season. My son's going to turn one this summer. But even there's so much information these days, right, about like what to do with your baby, sleeping and eating and development. And there's all these different um, thoughts about this should happen now or this should happen later or this is what it looks like and sleep training and baby led weaning and, and all. The, there's so much information and opinions about what to do and how to do it. There's all these voices telling us what it means to be a woman, what it means to show up, how to be a mom, what a mom should look like. Women hold so many pieces. And what I love about the way of Jesus and even the development of the early church, there's a message that a Jesus has to give to us about what it means to be a woman and what it means to show up and have the capacity to hold. That although womanhood and motherhood may be defined by so many external voices, Man, the way of Jesus and the early church also speaks in to women and to their role and to what they have to give. 
When I look at the life of Jesus or the story of the early church, I see that women are included and elevated, that they participated in the message of Jesus and participated in the early church significantly. When I think about just the important moments of, of the life of Jesus and of the good news of the gospel, I, I, I see women. I, I think of when Jesus was on the cross during the crucifixion. It was the women who stayed to the end after everyone had left. When I think about the resurrection of Jesus, who was present in the empty tomb, it was the women who went there to, to find Jesus and saw that the tomb was empty. It was the women who were empowered with the good news of Jesus that they were supposed to deliver to the apostles who were going to deliver it, right, to the rest of the world. It was the women that have held the good news of the gospel in unique and significant ways. And so I believe what that tells us is that we have a chance this morning to lean in to what Jesus has to say, to what the Bible says, to what the early church is experiencing around what it is that women hold. So we're going to look today um, in a specific story in Romans, the story of Phoebe. And I have to tell you, I do love a good story. I think stories have the capacity to communicate, to uh, reveal information, to be able to compel in such a unique way. I think my love for story kind of overlaps with my love for people. When I remember back when I was in, uh, I think, seventh grade, we had a speech contest that I entered like through my English class. And the goal of the sort of competition was you had to pick a time in history and offer a compelling speech that shares information but also kind of um, paints the story of this time in history. And so as any good millennial would, I chose the Oregon Trail because why not, right? Like that's what you do. So I chose the Oregon Trail. If you know, you know. And instead of just talking about facts about the Oregon Trail, I talked about certain characters of the Oregon Trail and chose to sort of teach about that time in history and the facts and the information through the stories of people who experienced it. And that's, that kind of has been my approach uh, moving forward is, is it's really in the story. And I think you probably can't separate people from their stories. That if you do, you lose the humanity, you lose the dignity, the worth, and the value of people. For me, stories and people go hand in hand. You cannot separate the two. And when we look at the story of Scripture, the big, broader story of the Bible, we see that it is ultimately the whole Bible all put together is ultimately a story of God's love and pursuit of his people. Of him offering a better, holistic way a way that is better than anything they could do on their own or better than they hoped or imagined. And he pursues his people out of love to experience healing and freedom in him. And as we look at the broader story, we see these individual chapters of the book of the Bible and there's stories playing out in each chapter, right? We've been in the book of Romans. We just started. We're going to continue in the book of Romans. And we're talk Romans is maybe one of the most significant stories of the gospel in the New Testament. But even in the book of Romans, there are stories beneath the broader story, and that brings us to the story of Phoebe. We may have to dig a little deeper to know more about her, but her story is there nonetheless. And so let's jump in here, Romans 16, verses 1 and 2. It says, I commend, you, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deacon of the church in Sanctuary. I ask that you receive her in the Lord in a way that is worthy for his people and give her any help she may need from you. For she has been the benefactor of many people, including me. So in this section of Romans, what we are reading is a letter that Paul has written to the Roman church. And in this letter, he is uh, talking about this woman, Phoebe, who was a leader during that time. He's kind of throwing some weight behind her to, to help describe to everybody who she is and what she is about. And I think this is so interesting because what this points to is that there's another story here. Like, who is this Phoebe? Have we heard about her before? What has her contribution been to the early church? And when I think about the story of Phoebe, I think about each of our individual stories that we bring into the room today. I think about the voices and the narratives that have shaped our own stories. 
about the identities that we've assumed or held because of what's been spoken over us. I think about all the external factors that kind of influence us and, and, and help us or make us determine what we are about. And this morning, I think as we unpack the story of Phoebe, we also have an opportunity to unpack just how God wants to speak into our individual stories today. How empowered are you feeling in your own story? Where are you in your story? How are you able to show up in your story? There are two descriptors about Phoebe that we're going to unpack in relation to her story. The first descriptor is this um, one called diakonos or deacon. And what that kind of translates to is this idea of being entrusted. The first indicator of Phoebe's story is that she is entrusted. So let's talk more about that. This um, term, diakonos, which kind of translates to deacon, would communicate that she was a leader in her church, that she maybe even hosted church out of her home. This term was often used to describe mostly men, but is now also used to describe Phoebe. She was a pastor. She was an evangelist. She was a leader in the early church sharing the good news of Jesus and doing life together with her church community. We can when we see this word attached to Phoebe, that lets us know more of what Paul was trying to say about her. We don't know anything about her family or her relationship status, but we know that she was a woman, a part of the early church. She was of affluence and has had significant role in society as well in the early church movement. And so what Paul is doing here in this text is he is establishing her as a leader and a pastor and a sister. See, at this point in Paul's ministry, he's not able to deliver or get to all the churches that he is speaking to. The the chapter of Romans is a letter that Paul wrote to the Roman church. He didn't, like, email it, right, or they couldn't Google it. Like, it literally had to be delivered, And Paul just did not have the ability to be in all places at once. And so there were some churches that he did not visit in person that he sent someone else instead. Well, Phoebe was the one designated to legitimately deliver the letter of Romans to the Roman church. She was the one who was chosen. She was the one who was entrusted with the literal scroll of Romans. And so that means that she had to make an incredible journey, that in the ancient world, traveling from her city, that which, is a, which was a port city near Corinth, all the way to Rome, would have meant that she had to greatly depend on the hospitality of the church community along the way. This was not an easy journey. It was a dangerous journey, but it was one that Phoebe was entrusted with. And when she got to Rome, she didn't just kind of hand over the letter. No, she would have been the one to orate the letter to the church. You see, she had the closest proximity to Paul as he was writing the letter of Romans. So when the church maybe had questions or they were confused or, wait, that part doesn't make sense, it would have been Phoebe who would have been the one to, to help deliver Paul's intent and vibe about the letter to the people. Phoebe literally held in her hands the good news of the gospel through the letter of Romans. I mean, isn't that fascinating? Isn't it fascinating that maybe that's new information for many of us, that that she played such an integral part in the early church experience and the advancing of the gospel? She was entrusted. And I just wonder um, how that word entrusted Like how that feels for each of us. I wonder when you think about your season, if you consider what is your role in this season? What identities are you carrying? What are you holding? You know, I think um, a lot of what we deal with, especially as women, is this idea of insecurity. And I think a lot of that comes from all these external messages about us being formed from something else apart from us. I think that we can struggle with, am I good enough? Am I, am I right enough? Do I have what it takes? Can I, can I make these decisions? Can I do this thing? Can I hold the weight of all of this? Maybe there's somebody who would do it better than I can. Is this the right choice? Is this the right decision? Maybe I'm not really meant to do this. Maybe I am not good enough. 
And I, what I think this word entrusted really speaks to is sort of the opposite of this insecurity that we so often deal with as women. That we have been entrusted with whatever it is we have to do and to give. And that is not by accident. It is on purpose. It is not by accident that out of everybody around, Phoebe was the one entrusted to hold the good news of the gospel. I had a conversation with a mom just this past week who's just navigating a really, really difficult medical health journey with her young daughter. And there's just choices as her mom that she has to make, and these choices can really determine sort of the path and the experience of life of her child. And she just talked to me about wrestling with the weight of that decision of what does that look like and what if I choose the wrong thing and I just, I just hold this responsibility as her mom and what I choose right now is going to determine something um, in her future. And it's just, it's, it's so much to carry. And, and as I just was able to sit with this mom in that reality, I know there's nothing I can do or say that's going to take away the weight of that responsibility. That part of being a woman and a mom is carrying the depth of realities of life just like that. It would actually be more concerning if she wasn't grappling with the weight of it, right? It's so normal and real to be grappling with the weight of what you've been entrusted with as a mom. But what I believe God is trying to tell us through his stories of women in scripture and, and what I was able to speak into this mom is, you know what? You are your daughter's mom on purpose. You were specifically chosen to be her mom. And it was, it was you, your way of thinking, your decision-making abilities, how you're wired. You are the one who has everything needed for your daughter. There's no one else who can do it better than you. You are the one who is entrusted with this decision, and it is yours. And the good news is that you don't have to carry that weight by yourself. You don't have to be stuck in questioning on if you're doing the right thing or the wrong thing. You just get to move forward with the next and the next and the next right thing. And God is a God who's behind you and for you. He is going to make things that don't make sense make sense. He's going to put those numbers together in a way that it doesn't work. He's going to go ahead and have um, a good plan in place no matter what it is we experience in our circumstances. You don't have to question if you're good enough or right enough. You just have to know that you are entrusted with what you have been given, that it is not on accident, it is on purpose, and that God is going ahead of you and before you, that the decision is not just yours. Look at what he did for Phoebe. Look at how he plays out in the details of our lives. You aren't in this alone. You see, the roles of women just incorporate moms and caretakers and lead leaders and business owners and teachers and planners, and there is so much to be held and as women, we have this capacity to hold space for the tension of what we've been entrusted versus what the messages are saying about us as women or moms or if we fit or not. But you've been entrusted with whatever it is you hold. And you have the capacity to hold space for the highs and the lows of that experience. I, the second element I want to talk about regarding Phoebe is this idea of empowered so again, when Paul was describing her, he used another word that indicates to us something about her story. He used the word prostasis, which means benefactor. So what this tells us is that Phoebe was a woman of uh, affluence in society. She had access to resources, and she mobilized her resources and her life towards the early church, which also meant towards people in need. So Phoebe showed up. She, she was a servant, but she also was smart about how she mobilized her life, her influence, and her resources. Oftentimes when we hear Paul talk about uh, other leaders, he, he really emphasizes like the co-leadership of people. But with Phoebe, he really elevates her and makes a point to help her stand out among the rest and to say she has helped out so many in the church. She has even helped out me. This is who she is. This is our experience of her. As I learned more about women in the early church uh, movement, I, saw that I found out that the church was full of women. That actually uh, women who were affluent in society often experienced being marginalized. 
And they, the, the message of the early church to, to elevate the voices of the oppressed and to meet the marginalized was a really attractive message to these women because they had known that experience and they had so much compassion and empathy for people in their community who were marginalized or oppressed. And so it was women who were, who were so much a part of this early church movement, sharing the good news of Jesus, mobilizing resources to people in need, caring for each other, doing life together, extending tangible needs to the poor. It was women who were so a part of the backdrop of this church. In fact, it wasn't until uh, after the third century that more kind of patriarchal values took over and women were kind of taken out of some of those roles. But before that, man, they were a part of the movement. And they were mobilizing their resources towards people and towards the good news and towards advancing the kingdom. Something I love about this idea of being empowered is when I look at Phoebe, I look at her life and I see that she took whatever it is she had and she released it. Whatever it is she was entrusted with, she didn't get stuck in, like, is it right that I do this? Or am I in the right season of life? Or does it make sense for me to do this journey? Or what's everybody going to say about me when I choose to do this? Or how do I maybe show up as the only person in this way? She just did it. She took what it was she had, and she offered it up and said, this is, this is what I have to give, God. You take it and move it towards your kingdom. She took what she held, and she allowed it to be used. And I cannot imagine that this would have been easy. I imagine that there would have been many narratives and opinions that she'd have to navigate through. Many people saying, like, there's no way you're going to make that journey. There's no way it's going to work. This isn't, this isn't how it works. I can imagine she had to really come up against a lot of narratives and story and names and identities and roles and expectations of other people. And that it may have been confusing to reconcile who she was as a woman, her season of life, her sphere of influence, with what it was that God was entrusting her with and asking her to do. I can imagine there would have been confusion and difficulty and questioning. And what I love so much is I think this idea of women in the early church and what it is they were empowered to do reminds us that it doesn't matter what it is that people say about us or believe about us, what external messages or narratives we are getting about our worth or value, that in Jesus we are empowered to show up in our own story, that we are empowered to look around at what we have, what we've been given, and to use it for a greater purpose that is bigger and beyond ourselves. But I know that as we come in this morning and we are each holding our own stories, that there are narratives and identity and names that have been set against us, that have shaped our story, that have shaped our worth, that maybe have been said about us more about, it's more about that person than it has been about our own experience. And I think it can be confusing and foggy to navigate what roles we've assumed, what narratives or identities we've taken on from other people's opinions or beliefs versus who we were made to be and what it is God is asking us to do, how he has empowered us to show up in our story. One of my most favorite stories is, this, um, is in, uh, in the Bible, is in the book of John, where Mary, one of the followers of Jesus, is first at the tomb, and she sees that it's empty. And Jesus appears to her as what she thinks is like an angel or a gardener, and it's really Jesus, but she doesn't recognize him. She just, in her story so far, she's been following Jesus. It has really shaped her identity, and now she's at this tomb where the, the, the tomb is empty, and he is gone, and she saw him die. And so for her, this story has been greatly shaped by what's happening around her. Can you imagine her experience of what are people going to say about her? What are they going to say about what she believed, what she did? But when Jesus presents himself to her, how she recognizes him is when he calls her by her name. He calls her by her name. And in an instant, it's like the lights go on. And she, she says, my Lord, Jesus, my Lord. It is the name that he spoke over her versus the name that society or family or culture or whatever it is spoke over her. It was the name that Jesus spoke that reminded her of who she was, of who he was, of the bigger story playing out, of what she was empowered to do. 
I love that when we bring the reality of what we're experiencing, the reality of our story to Jesus, he calls us by our name. The truth of God reminds us that we were created for a purpose. We were created to participate in this beautiful story of the good news, that the places um, around us that are broken, that the places around us that are dark, that we were created to bring light, to bring beauty, that we were created to speak life into our families, that we were created to go into our workplaces and bring hope and peace, that we were created to look at our society and our systems and our structures and see what's broken and what's oppressing people and what doesn't make sense and, and fix those systems and put them together in a way that's more holistic and a way that reflects the image and the purpose of God. We have been called by name to usher in the good news of the kingdom, which is healing and freedom and hope for people. And I just want us to remember this morning as we consider what it means to be entrusted and empowered in our season of life. That there is nothing that we don't have. There is nothing that we need that we, that we don't have. There is no story that's been spoken over us that is too great or strong to hold up against the mighty name of Jesus as he calls you by your name. And he reminds you who you are and he reminds you of who you were made to be. And I think the most compelling stories of the good news, the most compelling stories of the gospel, what we see in the scripture in the way of Jesus is unlikely people being included in the story of Jesus in the advancement of the gospel that often communicates that message in its most unaltered form. The way of Jesus, it is the unlikely people I think we've been given a lot of messages about what it looks like to lead or what it looks like to have influence or what it looks like to have purpose. And I think we've gotten mixed up about that in the church. What it looks like to lead isn't just standing on a platform or performing. It's not doing everything perfectly. It's not doing everything right. It's not just making a bunch of decisions. Do you know that in the way of Jesus that leading and influence has to do with serving and loving and compassion? It is the unlikely people. It is the hidden places. It is the people in the margins and on the ground. These are the people that the gospel is closest to. These are often the people that Jesus used to spread the good news of the gospel. And I think we forget as women and as people that our purpose might not look like somebody else's, but it is ours. And it is one of influence and goodness. I think we have a long history of spiritual fathers in the church and that is good. And we, we need that representation. But I also think that, that the ability of a mom to come alongside, to speak life, to heal, to remind you of who you are, to not just give you what you want, but what you need. You need your mom when you're hurting, when you're confused, when you're lost. And I know so many of us feel some of that about the church in this season. It can be a little confusing. We can feel a little lost a bit disillusioned. And I just wonder what it looks like for the spiritual mothers of our community to rise up and to speak life and goodness and truth and healing and make space and hold the tension and be present and bring comfort. Because when you're hurting, you just want your mom. And what a role of spiritual mothers around us. I think... um, as we think about our stories, God is just asking us to not, to stop resisting, right? Our limitations, our insecurities, our vulnerabilities, and just to release what it is he's given us. To look around our homes, our workplaces, uh, the, the places in our city that we go, the people that we know, the places we show up, and just to ask God with an open hand, what does it mean? to show up in this space in an entrusted and empowered way. How can I release this to you? And as we do that, we live out our stories and each of our stories comes together and becomes our story as the church. If you are feeling a sense of insecurity in your story this morning, remember you have been specifically entrusted. It is not by accident. You have all you need. If you are here dealing with unworthiness or feeling unvalued, know that 
All of who you are is empowered towards your story. Women have historically carried this ability to nurture and adapt and care and heal and hold. And I just can't think of any better characteristics to bring to a world that is hurting and broken and in need of something real than those characteristics of a mother, of a woman who's able to hold the tension of so many things. So I just wanna take a moment to kind of step back and just connect to whatever it is you may be experiencing or holding or bring it in today. Whether it's those feelings of insecurity or unworth, whether it's wrestling with a story that's been spoken over to you or trying to get out of an identity or a box that you've been put in, or it's even feeling connected to your own story or your own way, or what is it that I've been entrusted with? What is it that I hold? And I just wanna make space that Whatever it is you've come in with this morning, there's always room to start new. I had a conversation with my daughter this weekend um, in the car. There, we had some behavior things, some parenting moments that we were working through. And there were some consequences that were probably warranted for that behavior, right? And uh, that I just felt in her like she had, made, she had made the wrong decision, that she had made the wrong choice. But I felt in her like a disappointment that she did that and kind of like a, a desire to do it right, you know? And so I just felt there was an opportunity. And so I said, I said, um, Romy, do you need a second chance? Yeah, yeah, mama, I do. And so we talked about what does that mean to have a second chance? How do you acknowledge what happened, make it right, and start again? There's always room to start again. And so we did that. And we kind of, you know, we made it right and we moved on with our day. And later she comes up to me and she says, Mama, are second chances just for special? And in our family, we use that just for special, like, is this treat just for special, we're gonna have this treat, or it's like just for special, we're gonna go to the park, or it's just for special, we're gonna do this today. And she said, our second chance is just for special. And I thought, what an interesting question. She's trying to understand the dynamic of like, when do I get a second chance versus when do I not, right? And she's the chief negotiator, so I'm sure she's gonna use that later. But as I, I wanted her in that moment to know, you know what, second chances aren't just for special. Because in Jesus, second chances are like the main thing, right? Second chances are the whole story. Second chances aren't just for once in a while or when you do something really bad. Second chances aren't just for, spe for special. They are the message of Jesus. That no matter what we've experienced, what we've done, what we carry, what we messed up, what we didn't do, what we're holding on to, what it is that's weighing us down, that you can always have a second chance in Jesus anytime, anyway, and start new. It is never too late. It is never too over. It is never too dark. And it is never too messy. That in Jesus, second chances are not just for special. They are for you. They are for you today, over and over and over again. And so as we consider our realities this morning, as we consider our stories, as we consider our battles with insecurity and worthiness and value and showing up in our story, may we take that second chance, not just for special, but for today. And I think a way to help us do this together and remind us of the truth of God, not just the truth that we live out, is an opportunity to speak the truth of God over us and over our situation. We did this last year. We're going to do it again this year. I think it's going to be a Mother's Day tradition. But I'd love all the women in the room, any, any women in the room, just stand up. I'm standing up with you. Come on, stand up with me. I'm not gonna make you do anything crazy. We're just, gonna, we're just gonna read some phrases on the screens and remind ourselves of the truth of God, of the message that he speaks over us, of the narrative that he has written for our story and of what is true about us today. So we're gonna go through each screen. We're gonna say what's on the screen together and then I'm gonna read the verse over each of you. And I invite you to just receive in whatever that looks like for you. So the first one, let's read it together. God will give me wisdom to deal with any situation. If any of you lacks wisdom, it says in James, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach and it will be given to him. Next one, let's read it together. I am kept in perfect peace 
You keep in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts you. Isaiah 26, verse three. Let's read the next one. God flows abundance into my life. I'm like a tree planted by a river of his gifts. It says, but they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. They are like trees planted along a riverbank, bearing fruit in every season. Their leaves never wither, and they prosper in all they do. Psalm 1, verses 1 through 3. Here's a good one. Let's say this one together. God has called me by name. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. And when you walk through fire, you shall not be burned. Isaiah 43, 1 verse 2. Okay, we got a couple more. We're doing good? Letting this sink in, ladies? All right. God will give me fresh strength as I wait on him. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall not run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Isaiah 40, verse 31. Okay, we got two more. Ready? I am deeply valued for who I am, not just what I do. The Psalm says, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts. How vast is the sum of them. And our last one, here we go. I am faithfully loved by God. Because of the Lord's steadfast love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. If you are here this morning and you are next to a mom or your mom or a mom figure, just go ahead and extend a hand towards her. We're going to pray for the moms today in this room. Um, so we'd love to just gather as a community around just these women who hold this role of moms in our lives, in our church life, in our family life, and pray over you this morning. Father, thank you for the gift that you have given moms. Thank you for the capacity you have given to hold, to be entrusted, to be empowered. Thank you, God, for the purpose that you have called moms to as it changes and grows and evolves in so many seasons. I pray that you would speak against insecurity. I pray that you would speak against unworthiness. I pray that instead you would speak in life and goodness and grace and beauty. God, that you would call each of these moms by name right now in this moment, that you would remind them of who you say they are because it is based in who you say you are. I pray that you would speak life, that your Holy Spirit would just speak to their heart in a unique way and that they would remember that they are seen and known and loved by you first so that they may go see and know and love the children and communities around them. I thank you for the potential of a mom, for the impact that she has generation after generation after generation, for the ability of women to shape and form and bring life and speak and heal by the power of the Holy Spirit. I pray, God, that you would just bring each of our moms meaning and value and goodness this week, that they would be reminded of their story that is shaped by your story. I pray that as we grow as a church, we would just have the capacity to make room for spiritual fathers and spiritual mothers, and that you would reveal more of yourself to us as we make more room at the table for what it means to show up and follow Jesus. Thank you for the work of your church. Thank you for the work of your gospel. Thank you that you are a God who invites each of us in as we are authentically ourselves and that you have this great capacity to hold the tension with us. We love you so much. It's in your name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you so much to all the moms who are here this morning. Be blessed, have an amazing day, enjoy the sun. Come back next week, we'd love to see you next week. Have a great week, everybody. See you later.